shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19.5「Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have, I guess, the most wonderful Sabbath day in the month of October I could ever imagine, because outside we have about 75 degrees today, the sun is shining, it's a wonderful, wonderful day, reminds me on July instead of October, which we are here. And I'm gathered here together this afternoon with three other brothers in Christ. Two are coming from Germany and one is coming from the United States of America. That is, of course, Brett Norman, as you probably know already. Because we are here today on the, probably, at least we planned this to be the last video on the series, is um, Was Peter Ever in Rome? Simon Peter Meets the Competition, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. You know the drill, you know the numbers. You know the names. This is the last series of this that we are going to do. At least it is planned that we can do this in one hour. It's only four pages of reading, so normally that should not be a problem. And um, if it is a problem in one hour, we can even go a few minutes beyond that. But I planned to bring the series today to an end. But before I do so, I want to introduce you, of course, to my guests that I have today and they who are uh, all together with me, connected via Skype. Just have to put this here on not bothering, so I don't hear anything else. And um, I don't have, because it was on a very short notice, I don't have an avatar for brother Max, who joins us today from Germany for the very first time. So he can think about what he wants to say um, when I greet him in a moment. But first, let's introduce Michael from Germany, who you know already. Hello, Michael, and welcome to the broadcast today. How are you? Hello, dear listeners. Thank you for thanks for having me. Uh, same weather here, of course, obviously, like every time. And I'm very glad that uh, I will be learning much more of this book from Ralph Woodrow in order to add to the old reading of Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. Good. And then Brett. Hello, brother. And welcome. And I hope that you have rolled out of bed already. Fine, yeah? Ah, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> A little late this morning, as usual, you know? Yeah. It's... Uh, just how it works over here. Uh, we've had a lot of rain. It's been cool, damp, uh, kind of miserable, <laughs> but uh, warm at least, a little bit warmer. Uh, but it was getting really cool. The wind's been whipping around. Trees are getting to be beautiful in, in the yard here. So, yeah, can't complain, you know, very well. Good. So then I'm going to just show the Skype picture and then I'm going to introduce uh, Maximilian, who will be with us today, and uh, who is the translator of the book Romanism and the Reformation from the English language in which Henry Gretton Guinness wrote it in 1888. And he translated that book into German, and we are doing every week one recording of me reading and then one hour of discussion afterwards on Sunday evenings in German. Now on this book, Romanism and the Reformation, which Max translates into German. Yes, uh, hello Max and welcome to this broadcast, uh, the very first one we do together and the very first one of course also then in English. Yes, uh, my first time in, in English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, hello everyone and um, uh, much appreciate it, the invi invite um, and uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to, to hear um, yeah, um, where you guys are so far in this uh, PDF and um, yeah, I'm more like a quiet listener today, I think. But um, <laughs> that's um, all right. 
Yeah. If you have any yeah. questions or any remarks, you just uh, shout in whenever I'm not really in the middle of a sentence or something, and um, <laughs> I, will. Yeah. I, I will see that I get to this, and, and the other guys know the procedure, of course. Okay? So, um, let's go and start there. Uh, you already gave the idea. Um, it is about reading was Peter in Rome and you spoke about the PDF. Now um, the point is uh, the Bible says that uh, every proof should be established by two or three witnesses, right? And while we're doing these video series of that Peter was never in Rome, that Peter was never the first Pope and that Peter meets the competition on, in, in the person of Simon Magus, the Samaritan, uh, we established that firstly by a 24-page PDF that I took from Presence of God Ministries, as you remember, and we spoke in five hours on that paper. Then we took the book of Ernest L. Martin, Simon Peter Meets Simon the Sorcerer, and in 11 broadcasts we went through those 34 pages of Ernest L. Martin's book. And then, uh, now for the third witness to establish, I'm going to take this one, this is Babylon Mystery Religion. It is a book written by Ralph Woodrow in 1966. This is the original cover. And don't confuse it with the one that he published in the end of the 1990s, uh, the Babylon Mystery Collection. Connection, that is a total... Uh, how do you say that? <laughs> it's an abomination, that book, really. He recanted of everything... Uh, and I did a video to refute his recantation anyway. Just go to my playlist on Juggler 66, Babylon Mystery Religion. The playlist and the last video in that playlist is a, 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 a refutation of his recanting of that book. Uh, I still very much believe that this book is absolute truth and he proves in chapter 10 of his book, Babylon Mystery Religion, First and for all, by citing the Bible, which is always the foundation for our broadcasts, in this case, in English, of course, the 1611 King James Bible, he uses the claims of the, of the Bible to prove that Peter was not the first Pope. And this, to me, is, I think, a very fitting uh, video to produce at the end of this reading of this 16 videos that we've done so far with this 17th part now, was Peter the first Pope taken from Babylon Mystery Religion. But I am not going to read from this original PDF, just because uh, this PDF is not possible to uh, underline something or to take notes or whatever, as you can see. But I have another here, and this is the one that I read um, when I did the reading of the complete book. Um, this is uh, one that a former brother in Christ did for himself. He produced that. And every time when uh, Ralph Woodrow in his book was speaking of uh, Babylon mystery religion or something, or pagans, or a pagan religion or whatever, he changed that into S-U-N sun worship, at least in all the other chapters. In this one, this doesn't appear that much. And I used this one to read at the time, and as you can see, it is easy to read. And I have prepared a little movie that I'm going to let run right now here. And viewers from YouTube. Without George. any sound, of course. That is the original video that I produced in the original reading of Babylon Mystery Religion um, Was Peter the First Pope, as you can see. And we can have a look at this while I'm reading this. And now I'm going to read this PDF to you and my brothers in Christ will intervene with questions or remarks whenever they have them, as you are uh, already used to these videos when you listened to my work. So, was Peter the first Pope? This is chapter 10 of the book Babylon Mystery Religion. Standing at the head of the Roman Catholic Church is the Pope of Rome. This man, according to Catholic doctrine, is the earthly head of the Church and the successor of the Apostle Peter. And here already I did a comment, a very lengthy comment that is taken from the book Rulers of Evil. On page 285 in the book, or page 308 of the PDF of Rulers of Evil, we read, according to what is the um, what the author says here, about this man, about the Catholic doctrine, about Peter, it says here, Since the epoch of Emperor Constantine, the Roman papacy was fostered the concept that the ruler who terrorizes wrongdoers is necessarily a Christian. Pope Sylvester, 
by the way, he is the one of which we, in, at least here in Europe, have the name of the last day of the year, 31st of December, which we call Sylvester here. He is the name giver for that name. That Pope Sylvester, the Bishop of Rome, who supposedly converted Constantine to Christianity, saw nothing strange in a warrior coming to faith in a crucified Christ by slaughtering his enemies. This thinking pervaded Sylvester's successors as well as the Crusaders, the Holy Roman Empire, European nationalism, the American Revolution, the War of Southern Secession and the wars of the 20th century. Indeed, perhaps, the Black Papacy's most admirable psychological conquest is that Protestants generally agree that armed rulership is an authority instituted by God for Christians to exercise. Now, since there is no scriptural authority for a member of the body of Christ to bear any kind of armament whatsoever, other than the figurative reverie of words God, as we can read in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, let me add here, agreeing to such a principle signifies prima facie adherence to the moral guidance of him who bears the power of Almighty God on earth, the person who legitimately bears the mark of Cain, in a long succession, begun with Peter. Yes, the popes can truthfully declare that Peter is their foundation by holding in mental reservation that the Hebrew jir pronounced Peter and Peter means firstling, which of course is Cain's primary attribute as firstborn of Eve. That is what Tapa Saucy had to say to the subject, and we went already earlier in other broadcasts of this series into the same subject, so I'm not going to go into that again. You can understand that the Peter, which means firstborn, Cain, is the Peter the Roman Catholic Church calls themselves of, of apostolic succession. As you remember that Antichrist, Pope, John the 23rd, during the Second Vatican Council, had that prayer about that he said that we uh, are bearing the mark of Cain. Here you can see the text, by the way, that I just read to you, running through the video. But also, of course, from the series of the series that we did, you understand that not that Peter, not Cain, is the very first Peter, but even there is another possibility, and that is Simon, that is Simon the sorcerer. Okay, that is something we established by the reading of the book of Ernest L. Martin. So, to me, actually, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't matter which Peter you take, as long as you take uh, as you don't take the Apostle Peter, who surely was not the Peter the Roman Catholic Church builds its apostolic succession on. Anyway, the author continues and says, According to this belief, Christ appointed Peter as the first pope, who in turn went to Rome and served in this capacity for 25 years. From him, it is claimed, a succession of popes has continued to this day, a very important part of Roman Catholic doctrine. It's one of the absolute basic pillars that Rome stands on. Apostolic succession by the Apostle Peter is one pillar and the Eucharist is another. Did, the institute, uh, did he institute the papal office, Peter? Did Christ ordain one man to be above all others in his church, is the first question. Did he? If he did, we can find proof of that in the Bible. Did Jesus Christ institute the papal office? Did he appoint Peter as the supreme pontiff? Now, according to the scriptures, Christ is the head of the church and not the pope. Therefore, we read Ephesians chapter 5, but not only verse 23, but I have copied for you from the King James Version, verse 20 through 23. What does the Bible say? Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting, right? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
unquote, from the Bible. So this does not speak of the Pope, does it? <clears throat> the photograph to the right, this one you see here with St. Peter's toeless toes, the photo to the right shows the toeless toes of St. Peter that is located in St. Peter's at Rome. Long lines of people wait daily to pass before it and kiss its foot. Bronze statue of St. Peter, the feet have been made toeless from thousands and millions even of people touching them over the years. Yeah, um, yeah. even worse, millions kissing his feet. More on the toes in the next chapter, which we are not going to speak about today. But here just a little remark that I made time and time again. And we did that already in earlier broadcasts of this reading too. The statue of St. Peter was taken from the Roman pantheon where it resembled Jupiter, but after the baptizing of the Roman pagan empire itself with Christianity, what we spoke here earlier about, they transported it to St. Peter's and renamed it Peter. And the pantheon became a Roman Catholic church in 609 AD. You can look that up in historical records also. Now, James and John once came to Jesus asking if one of them might sit on his right hand uh, and the other on his left in the kingdom. In eastern kingdoms, the two principal ministers of state ranking next in authority to the king hold these positions. That's why they were asking. Now, if the Roman Catholic claim is true, it seems that Jesus would have explained he had given the place on his right to Peter and did not intend to create any position on the left. But to the contrary, here was the answer of Jesus. Quote, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise dominion upon them, but it shall not be so among you. Therefore we can read in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 43. And I have prepared that reading for you a little bit, so that we can read everything here in the right context. Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 and following. Quote, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came <coughs> come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall desire. <laughs> we shall desire, huh? <laughs> and he said unto them, What would ye say I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit on thy right hand, and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. When, and when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are encountered to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Unquote. Now certainly this argues against the concept that one of them was to be a pope, ruling over all others in the church as, in the church as bishop of bishops. Jesus further taught the concept of equality by warning the disciples against the use of flattering religious titles such as Father, because the word Pope means Father, Rabbi or Master. Matthew chapter 23 verses 4 through 10 it says, For one is your Master, even Christ, he said, and all ye are brethren. Matthew chapter 23 we are going to read a few, a few verses from that, because I think it is always important to see these verses taken in this book and read them in context. Here you have a picture of the Pantheon, by the way. 
Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms and feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man or your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But Roman Catholics are taught that Peter was given such a superior position that the entire church was even built on him. The verse that is used to support this claim is Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, quote, and I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we spoke already long time in previous broadcasts in this series about Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And we understood that it was not Peter, but that it was Jesus Christ upon that rock will be built the church and not a fallible man in that regard, Peter. If we take this verse in its settings, however, we can see that the church was not built on Peter, but on Christ. In the verses just before, Jesus asked the disciples who men were saying that he was. Some said he was John the Baptist. Some others said Elijah. Others thought he was Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked, But whom say ye that I am? Now to this Peter replied, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then it was Jesus. Uh, then it was that Jesus said, Thou art Peter, Petros, a stone, a rock, and upon this rock, Petra, a mass of rock, and a great foundation, rock of truth that Peter had just expressed, I will build my church. The true foundation upon which the church was built was Christ himself, not Peter. It is, in fact, Christ's church, not St. Peter's. Do we call it Christianity or do we call it Peterism? Huh? Now, Peter himself declared that Christ was the foundation rock. And we can read that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. We read from the Holy King James Bible, quote, to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed <coughs> sorry disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and precious ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ wherefore also it is contained in the scripture behold i lay in zion a chief cornerstone elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And the stone of stumbling, and the rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed." Unquote. Now he spoke of Christ as the stone which was set at naught of you builders. Neither is there salvation in any other. And therefore we read in Acts chapter 4 verses 11 and 12, quote, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. 
For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Unquote. Now, I think it is important that we stay a moment in this verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. And this is the very big difference with this dollar bill that you know, of course, with the all-seeing eye. Yeah? Let's see if I have here a fitting picture of the dollar bill. Of course, the question is just how many. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here it is. And here you see it is the capstone. The capstone is the all-seeing eye. And what do we read in this um, in the Bible, this is the stone which was at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner, not the head of the pyramid, not the top here, but the top of the corner, because that's what it holds, what holds it all together, right, Brad? I, yeah, that's right. Comment. Yeah, please. Uh, I think that's the big difference in having a cornerstone or having a top stone, because uh, the thing is uh, uh, stable in itself without the uh, top stone but not without the cornerstone and so that's the simple tr simple uh, simple truth about it you see if you if you take a look at the pyramids in Egypt you also see or it, it has been declared that there is a top stone missing and so i think it's uh, it's it's quite a uh, quite an interesting assemblance you're absolutely right and you are making the same point that we try to make in the in the same regard it is the cornerstone that is built upon. It is only the top stone that sets the top. But the top stone doesn't hold anything together. But the cornerstone holds it all together. And I think this is a very uh, interesting uh, understanding that we get from this. But here, and, and this is, I think, why this is so important. In Acts chapter 4, verse 11, we read about that Jesus Christ has become the head of the corner. And we see in the teaching of the Illuminati, Freemason, Jesuit, New World Order teaching that it is the capstone that is important and that is of course the quote-unquote all-seeing eye, the eye of Horus and by that it is the eye of Lucifer yeah, which watches over all that is built upon this but doesn't hold it together. And Jesus Christ is the one who holds it together and that's quite the difference in that understanding I think. That's the point we want to make. But it's a very legitimate point that you make, Michael. I mean, I mean, when you just go to the Bible and you start reading the Bible, you understand how things are supposed to be meant. And when you take these teachings, then you can all of a sudden discover the lie. And you can dismantle the lie, which is the reason why we are here for this reading, right? Dismantle yeah, the lie. True. And we always yeah. refer back to the Bible. And Acts chapter 4, verse 11 is very uh, precise on what Jesus Christ is. He is the cornerstone. Yeah? He is the stone to be built upon. Because you build on a cornerstone, you don't build on a capstone. Right? So, Jesus right. is that stone. Yeah. Well, you know, if I can make a comment. Yeah, sure you can. I mean, I think, you might. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, here in America... You know, we have this uh, this dollar bill that was established. Uh, was it uh, with the uh, 1913 uh, signing of uh, that? Uh, well, let's see. What was it? Uh, Jekyll Island. They met in Jekyll Island. Came up with a plan on how to do it and passed it through with Woodrow Wilson. Right. So, um, you know, it's interesting that uh, we look at. Uh, Roman, oh, and I'm sorry, I almost said Romans. Uh, the chapter of, um, uh, yeah, it is Romans 13, isn't it? Um, uh, Romans 13 deals with the governments of men. Yeah, yeah, and uh, also you have uh, Revelation 13, which deals with the first and second beast. Yes. And this is just pure vanity i mean uh, we were w driving it was working yesterday in st paul and there's this there's this little uh, uh, some kind of building that uh houses all of these different businesses and one of them says alchemy on it and i was just thinking you know that's so so odd 
to have this alchemy thing and you know promoting it but that's just paganism you know the world is just full of this kind of stuff and and you know I was telling the the fellow that I was working with yesterday that I just met uh recently he's really interesting open-minded type uh worker and uh, I was just telling him you know that the true alchemists are the ones that turn paper into gold right <laughs> I mean this is what this is yeah we've been really really duped really bad we don't have real currency we have paper currency which is totally uh, just a scam and the people just keep buying it you know and we're forced into it it's it's tradition gone nuts. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that one dollar is not uh, a currency. It is a debt note. It's a debt note. And it says yeah. so on the other side of the dollar bill. It says uh, this is uh, for all public and private debt, right? Yep, yep, that's legal tender. Legal tender for all public and private debt, right. Yeah. So May when I you add an Sorry? So when you pay with the dollar bill... You hand debt and not worth. Please, Michael. May I add another comment? Yeah, please. It's a little bit. Um, yeah, it's 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 not the well um, matter of this subject, but uh, concerning the all-seeing eye, I found a quite very remarkable um, website, and uh, I'd like to share it with you. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's um, it's about a theory which uh, where in which was in my head or is in my head since you can put this here in Skype in our in our text and I can open the website while you are talking about it. Yeah, I'm I'm about to mm -hmm. dividing my screen. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting you bring that up, because, Michael. Yeah, because you see the the all-seeing eye is all, also uh, always a reference for me to, uh, to Tolkien and uh, Sauron. The all-seeing eye in the Lord of the Rings uh, mm -hmm. movies, mm -hmm. and um, I found an, I found a website which I'm about to share, which is about uh, Tolkien and his Jesuit, and uh, Tolkien is cited with, um, although critics, no, sorry, um, the Lord of the Ring, uh, Tolkien is cited is of course a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first. But consciously, in the revision, in the revision, well, oops, I cannot speak English properly today. <laughs> in the revision, ah, yes. revision. So, talking wrote in a letter in 1953 to Robert Murray, a Jesuit priest, quote, "That is why I have not put in, or have cut out practically all references to anything like religion, to cults or practices in the imaginary world." For the religious element is absorbed into the story and symbolism. So every time it uh, pops into my head, it's a lot of the ring with the all-seeing eye of Sauron, which is the big enemy. And also the Lord of the Rings, for me simply, is the ring, is the treasure. And for me, simply, it's the ring of the Pope, which the, the, the rulers of the world are... Um, commanded to kiss and doesn't it say to obey. doesn't it say in lord of the rings i mean i've never saw that i never saw that mm -hmm. i never read it but doesn't it say one ring to rule them all yes correctly yeah. so then it must be the ring of the pope right because it he rules be. them yes, all right i think absolutely I think so. does the yeah, share screen work um i don't know you should not share a screen you should put this thing up but uh, let's see yeah yeah it's okay share it again now Okay. Okay, I can I can send you the link also. Yeah. Yeah. Now share screen. I have it here on. Uh, I have it here completely. I have it here up now. Mm -hmm. So when you share screen now, we can yeah. see what you are. But for the moment, I don't see anything. You don't share uh -huh. screen, brother. Come on. Uh, uh, you just did it. Yeah. You <laughs> can bring it back. No problem. Bring it back. No problem. Like so the okay. There. The article Ooh, was there. Went. No, it's not. No, you didn't share it again. <laughs> it's Come not on. working, is it? Oh well. It's oh. working. He's just pressing too many buttons. <laughs> ah, there. So, so share screen is on. Now, where's the article? There's the article. Okay. Yeah. yeah. J.R. Tolkien and his Jesuit. Yeah. Yeah. 
that was yeah. just what you were reading, right? Yeah, isn't that something? Yeah, it's quite interesting, you know, but as, as I said before, I never read uh, um, uh, Tolkien's work, uh, Lord of the Rings. I never Lord saw the these Rings, videos, yeah. no, never saw those movies because mm -hmm. I thought this oh, is just... Oh, it's really big. It was really big when we were growing up, I think, you know, in our 20s and yeah, teens. But, uh, I, was, I was never interested in it, so I thought it's just yeah. a waste of time. And, uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. You are wise. <laughs> you, you know, know some of our, our family members, uh, like my brother was into that. You know, he was checking out those books because everyone else is checking out those books. And that's kind of how this works. You know, you have friends and, oh, yeah, check this out. Da, 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 da. And you get tangled up in this crud. <laughs> Go ahead, Dirk. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. You don't have to be sorry for anything. I'm I'm just going to continue reading if it's okay for, for you guys. Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Let's close all this down. Back to the movie. And uh, we just read Acts chapter 4, verse 11, right? So, mm. the church was built on Christ, and the church still is built on Christ. He is the true foundation, and there is no other foundation. Quote, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Amen. Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. Yes, Brad? I'm sorry to butt in so rudely there, but uh, your screen share is off right now, Brad. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's because somebody else sh shared screen, so I got to do it again. That's right. cool. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I have and to see more options. I know, all the screens open, yeah? Yeah, no, the the point is somebody else should not share screen when I'm doing it because then otherwise I forget to uh, do it again. So. No problem, I got you covered. So now, now you got it, now you see it again? Beautiful, thank you. Okay, so um, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I mean, can you be more in the face telling the truth than this verse of the Bible? There is one foundation, and no other foundation can be laid but that which is laid by Jesus Christ, and which is Jesus Christ. When Jesus spoke of building his church upon a rock, the disciples did not take this to mean he was exalting Peter to be their pope. For two chapters later, they asked Jesus, who was the greatest, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. If Jesus taught the church would be built on Peter, the disciples would have automatically known who was the greatest among them. Yeah? Then he would have mentioned Peter. Actually, it was not until the time of Calixtus, which is a Roman emperor, uh, no, what you, <laughs> Calixtus was a bishop of Rome, from 218 to 223, that Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 was used in an attempt to prove the church was built on Peter and that the bishop of Rome was his successor. So, what does the author tell us here? It was not until the time of Calixtus in the beginning of the 3rd century, that is 150 years after the events, that Matthew chapter, was, uh, Matthew chapter 16 uh, verse 18 was used in an attempt to prove that the church was built on Peter and that the bishop of Rome was his successor. So it took them 150 to 160 years after the events to first quote unquote prove, quote unquote prove that the church was built on Peter and that the bishop of Rome was his successor. What does that do to apostolic succession, I ask of you? Now, if we take a close look at Peter in the scriptures, it becomes apparent that he was not a pope. And now we are going to deep Bible study again with a lot of verses that we are going to quote here. First of all, Peter was married. The fact that Peter was a married man does not harmonize with the Catholic position that a pope is to be unmarried. And not only a pope, but all of the clergy, right? The scriptures tell us that Peter's wife's mother was healed of a fever in Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 and 15, where we can read, quote, And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. 
of course there couldn't be a Peter's wife's mother if Peter didn't have a wife. Even years later, Paul made a statement which shows the apostles had wives, including Cephas, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, where it reads, quote, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? Unquote. Cephas was Peter's Aramaic name as we can read in John chapter 1, verse 42, quote, And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. 2. Peter would not allow men to bow down to him. When Peter came into his house, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am a man. As we can read in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 25 through 26. This was quite different from what a pope might have said, for men do bow before the pope. 3. Peter did not place tradition on a level with the word of God. On the contrary, Peter had little faith in traditions from your fathers, as we can read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, quote, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, unquote. His sermon on the day of Pentecost was filled with the word, not with traditions of men, when the people asked what they should do to get right with God, Peter did not tell them to have a little water poured and sprinkled on them. Instead he said, and this is a very, very important verse from Acts chapter 2 verse 38, quote, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, unquote. Now, why is this so important? I am subscribed to Chick Tracts, <coughs> a, cha a channel probably a lot of you guys know, right? Right. So, um, I received a video from Chick Tracts a few days ago, I think three days or something ago. I'm just going to open this up here and then we can have a look at it. I'm going to show it to you because he was making the statement that for salvation or for the forgiveness of sins no repentance is necessary now let's see if the computer is willing to work with me here and open this up and slowly slowly i'm sorry with sharing screen and all that stuff it takes ages before he opens this up here so i have to see in the history oh come on <sighs> Come, <laughs> this is ridiculous. It's really slow. Yeah, it's it's really slow. Chick tracts. So, going to Chick tracts his channel, and there we will see the video, the third but last one that he um, that he published one of these days. Yeah, I, I can't help it. I already have an an, an SDR uh, and uh, or, or what's this called SSD drive, and still yeah. and still it's uh, ridiculously slow. Yeah, this video here. Forgive or not, what does God say? Yeah. So let's go to this video. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And um, uh, normally well, I very much appreciate uh, Dan David Daniels's teaching, David W. Daniels' teaching from Chick Tracts, but this one I really had my trouble with, and that's why I commented mm -hmm. on this. And uh, my comment you can read here. I said. If forgiveness works without repentance, then nobody goes to hell. When you have general forgiveness, that means that you have no need to keep the law. When you don't have a law, there is no transgression of the law. And if you don't have a transgression of the law, you don't need to be saved, so you don't have a need for a Messiah. Jesus said, quote, If you love me, keep my commandments. Unquote. Why keeping his commandments when I'm forgiven anyway? 
Now, in my humble opinion, the asking of forgiveness of sins, as in the Lord's Prayer, for example, is a sign of repentance. What do you think? And he still didn't answer me. That's more than two days ago. I very much appreciate an answer on this. And how about this? And then I mention Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that we just read here in the PDF. You know? David W. Daniels makes the point that he forgives everyone for everything when they have trespassed against him. Without any repentance. And the Bible clearly says here in Acts 2.38 and also in other places, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What does that mean, the remission of sins? It says that your sins are being forgiven when you repent. When you don't repent, then your sins are not forgiven. Right? This is at least how I understand the Bible. There cannot be a general or quote-unquote universal forgiveness of sins without repentance. Because if that's the case, there is no hell. Everybody goes to heaven straight away. What does that do to Jesus Christ's teaching? What does that do to Jesus Christ's suffer and offering that he did on the cross 2000 years ago? Takes away everything our Lord stands for, right? So with this I absolutely disagree with um, brother David W. Daniels from Chick Publications. That's why I didn't even give it a thumbs up. I didn't give it a thumbs down anyway, but you know... Just something that I hardly, wholeheartedly disagree with. And this is why this verse from Acts chapter 2 verse 38 is so important in the regard of the reading of this chapter from Babylon Mystery Religion, where we read, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, Part 4 or point 4 Peter was not a pope for he wore no crown let's do this again Peter himself explained that when the chief shepherd shall appear then shall we quote receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away unquote in 1st Peter chapter 5 verse 4 now, since Jesus Christ has not yet appeared, <laughs> right? The crown that the Pope wears is not one bestowed upon him by Christ. In short, Peter never acted like a Pope, never dressed like a Pope, never spoke like a Pope, never wrote like a Pope, and people did not approach him as a Pope. In all probability, in the very early days of the Church, Peter did have the most prominent ministry among the Apostles. It was Peter who preached the first sermon after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and 3,000 were added to the Lord. Later, it was Peter who first took the Gospel to the Gentiles. Yeah? Whenever we find a list of the twelve Apostles in the Bible, Peter's name is always mentioned first. Matthew chapter 10 verse 2, Mark chapter 3 verse 16, Luke chapter 6 verse 14, Acts chapter 1 verse 13. Later it was Peter who first took the gospel to the Gentiles with Cornelius or whatever. I don't know. Um, that should be Paul normally, right? Anyway, but yeah. none of this... Yes, Brett? You have a... Yeah, it's true. I think you're right. I think Paul. that must be a, a typo, right? Uh, well, either that or just in the... Yeah, I don't know. Hard it to was, say. It was Paul who took the gospel to the Gentiles. He said, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now you rejected us, right? So, Right, that's I, true. I think that's, that's just a typo true. here. So That can happen when you do these PDFs on your own, like this former brother of Christ did some years ago. And by mm. that time, I didn't know that I had this available, so I read this one. Anyway, right, <laughs> got it. Yeah, and you know, it's easy who... to read. It is nice, and the pictures do help. Yeah, yeah, he did good. He did good work of it. That's right. But he should have told me that he left out the chapter, and he should yeah. have told me that he changed the words on the PDF. So, <laughs> right, right 
This which, is true. which he did not. And this is why I feel betrayed by that person. And that's why I say he is a former brother of Christ. And you know, without speaking the name, who I'm talking yeah. of, right? Yeah, that's so. right. But yeah. let's continue reading this. But none of this, not by any stretch of the imagination, would indicate that Peter was the Pope or universal bishop of bishops. While Peter apparently took the most outstanding role of the apostles at the very beginning, later on, Paul seems to have the most outstanding ministry. As a writer of the New Testament, Paul wrote 100 chapters with 2,325 verses, while Peter only wrote 8 chapters with 166 verses. Paul spoke of Peter, James and John as pillars in the church in Galatians 2, chapter, uh, Galatians 2 verse 9, quote, and when James, Cephas, as we know, that is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, Paul, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go on to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Again, this is proof of that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah? That we should go unto the Gentiles, heathen is another word for that, and they unto the circumcision. Cephas, James and John go to the circumcision, go to the Jews and keep preaching the gospel to the Jews. Nevertheless, he could say, quote, in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 11, which in, com in completion reads, quote, I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commented of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Unquote. But if Peter was the supreme pontiff, the Pope, then certainly Paul would have been somewhat behind him. On one occasion even, Paul even gave a rebuke to Peter, because he was to be blamed in Galatians chapter 2 verse 11, where we can read, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Unquote. Now, this is strange wording if Peter was regarded an quote unquote infallible Pope. Paul was called the Apostle of the Gentiles. And we can read that in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, where it says, quote, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the Apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Unquote. Whereas Peter's ministry, ministry was primarily to the Jews, as we can read in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, where we read, quote, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Unquote. Now this fact in itself would seem... Sorry. <laughs> this fact in itself would seem sufficient to show Peter was not bishop of Rome, for Rome was a Gentile city. All of this is indeed highly significant when we consider that the entire framework of Roman Catholicism is based on the claim that Peter was Rome's first bishop. There is no proof, biblically speaking, and that's the only speech that counts when you speak with the authority of the Bible, the Word of God, that must be your foundation when you speak of things like these. And nothing that the Pope speaks in regard of this is biblical. Yeah, if it looks like a duck, nice picture. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh. There is no proof, when we look at the Bible, for proof that Peter ever even went near Rome, let alone to Rome itself. We read about his trips to Antioch, Samaria, Joppa, Caesarea and other places, 
but never of Rome. Now this is a strange omission, especially since Rome was considered the most important city in the world. The Catholic Encyclopedia under the article Peter points out that a tradition appeared as early as the 3rd century for the belief that Peter was Bishop of Rome for 25 years, these years being, as Jerome believed, from 42 to 67 AD. A tradition appeared for the belief. Now, what does Jesus Christ say about tradition? I'm not going to bore you with looking up the Bible verses right now, but you know that he accused the scribes and the Pharisees that they hold the tradition of men above the word of God, right? Right. And this is exactly what the author is pointing out here. The Catholic Encyclopedia points out that a tradition appeared for the belief. No proof, no biblical proof that Peter was Bishop of Rome, but a tradition appeared for the belief where well, you should believe in Jesus Christ and not believe in that Peter was in Rome. Let me tell you that. Now, but this viewpoint is not without distinct problems. <laughs> of course it's not. About the year 44, Peter was in the council at Jerusalem, as we can read in Acts chapter 15. About 53 AD, Paul joined him in Antioch, as we can read in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, which we have cited earlier. I don't go into that right now. Then about 58 AD, Paul wrote his letter to the Christians at Rome, in which he sent greetings to 27 persons, but never mentioned Peter. And we read this part in one of the earlier parts of this reading. So, go back a few uh, readings in this playlist that this video is in and you will hear me read that part in the Bible where uh, Paul writes in the letter of Romans to 27 persons but never mentions Peter. I think that's in chapter 16 if I'm not mistaken. Imagine a missionary writing to a church greeting 27 of the members by name but never mentioning the pastor the chief pastor, the chief bishop. Now, the keys in the picture to the right, this is this one here that you see, supposed to, rep to represent the keys of the kingdom that was given to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And for that, I advise you to go to my reading against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil by Martin Luther, where Martin Luther goes deeply into the deception that Matthew chapter 16, verse 19 is misused by the Roman Catholic Church to make the claim that these keys have been given to him. And Martin Luther explains in detail how that is a false claim and these keys have not been given to Peter in the way that the Roman Catholic Church claims they have been given to Peter today. It's all a lie. Yeah? Go to my playlist. I read the whole book from Martin Luther, published in 1545, against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil, for a reason. Look it up and study it. And, yeah, how do you say that? Avail Absorb yourselves. Avail history. yourselves to that. It's yeah. huge. It's it's really something for me, Yerk. I really appreciate that one. Yeah, that's a great reading. Huh? I enjoy oh, that very much. Very, very fulfilling. Now, according to Roman Catholicism, these keys represent all authority in heaven and in earth, and Catholicism, as the rightful possessor, through the passing of those keys, has all authority. Now, Pope Gregory VII, the only Pope who canonized himself, drew up a dictatus, which is a list of 27 theses outlining his powers as, quote, Peter's vicar, prince of the apostles and chief shepherd, unquote. It is Catholic doctrine that, by changing Simon's name to Peter, was making him the first Pope and head of the Roman Catholic Church, as well as establishing apostolic succession. Catholic Popes would be given these keys of Peter to reign as 
Pontifex Maximus in Rome, a title held by the Caesars of Rome as well. As we remember, that was the very first one, Julius Caesar in 44 AD, who accepted the title of Pontifex Maximus. And the next Bishop of Rome who took the title of Pontifex Maximus was Innocent Boniface the Third in 606 through the power of the Roman Empire who reigned from Constantinople at that moment Emperor Phocas. And to learn about that again I just have to refer you to the book reading Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil by Martin Luther where also that is very much explained. And this ends chapter 10 of Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow and brings us to the end of the reading of this now 17 part series that established that Peter was never in Rome. We gave you biblical proof, we gave you historical proof and we gave you proof from three different sources. The letter from presenceofgodministry.org on 24 pages, the book by Ernest L. Martin on 34 pages, and now the chapter 10 of Babylon Mystery Religion in about 4 pages, where we read that Peter was never in Rome. If you have followed this whole series and you still don't get it, then you will never get it. But now, let me turn to my brothers in Christ for some concluding remarks in this series that we were reading. And um, I open this up and anybody can be the first or the last, I don't care. Please, Brett, Michael, Max, whenever you want to say something, just say something. I will blend in your picture in the meantime. Well, of course. Thank you, Jörg, for this uh, discussion and group that uh, we have here from Europe and, and here in the United States. And we have uh, uh, certainly uh, a great deal of things to consider about uh, Congress here in, in the meeting uh, the Pope had in 2015 and what he had said in that meeting, which uh, freaked me out when I listened in to that uh, on, the, on that day, September 24, 2015, when that happened. And... Uh, Ever since, the world has not been the same for me. So, again, thank you very much for continuing in the studies, and I'm looking forward to continuing as well with you, brother. So, that's my comments. Thanks, Brett. Okay, then I suppose it's my turn. First of all, I'd like to thank you, all of you, for this excellent reading on this excellent series because I have made I have got so much information which I'm sure that I haven't uh, f couldn't find it out on myself and so I'm very glad that this turned out to be an eye-opener um, I like to add one small comment to this lecture because you see I don't care what 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 thing strikes you to open the eye what the Roman Catholic Church or Universal Church is all about. It's just that from my childhood I always was suspicious of the Roman Catholic Church because I understand that the most, the, the hardest enemy which Jesus opposed, which Jesus opposed uh, was in fact not the Jewish people or the Roman pontiff or anyone else he met but in fact it were the high priests of his area and I've, if I, I looked it up in the meantime it actually should be a guy called Caiaphas Caiaphas, yeah. Caiaphas yes and he's believed to have been uh, the high priest at the time um, of Jesus' crucifixion, yeah. Yes, yes. He was yeah. the he was the one who stood in the temple when Jesus Christ yeah. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he saw the veil of the temple being ripped apart from top to bottom by God's power to expose the most holy place in the temple, to fulfill Daniel's seventieth week, where it says that he will bring the oblations and the sacrifices to cease. Yeah. 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 
So, and this high priest is, my, in my opinion, the force behind Jesus' uh, arrest. And so, you see, it hasn't been changed since then. No, Caiaphas was just a, a forerunner of the Antichrist. Yeah, yeah, that's my that's my understanding also. So I think nothing has changed. All leads all uh, roads lead to Rome, and I think if you if you if you you can make it up by you you cannot make this up. You can read it uh, or ex ex expose it in the Bible. You can look for yourself, but in the end, you always get to the same. The high priest had the power. The high priest have arrested Jesus Christ and nowadays it's the same it's, it's the same high priest are now called bishops and pope and what else cardinals and etc etc but the system hasn't changed and so the system which in the old days in the old world order has arrested the most humble being Jesus Christ the most profound man with knowledge the Son of God would also do the same in the present or in the future because they haven't changed actually it's the same same thing with, with the, the, the same emperor with new clothes but I think that's that's a, that's that's the most important thing I, I have learned from the Bible is that the arc enemy of the real belief is and was the high priest, the church of the so-called real faith, which is now nowadays the Roman Catholic Church. And I think I think it's 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 the essence of all which I have learned is that the church isn't that which is supposed supposes to be. It's just the Antichrist um, system in this world. And things things haven't changed. Things haven't changed just one bit. Semperialem, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The Roman Catholic Church never changes. And I think what you wanted to say about the high priest, so that nobody misunderstands that, is that the high priest in the Judaic realm at that time is like what the Pope is today in the Roman Catholic time, and he is just the vicar of Satan on earth. Yeah. Yeah. And by that he is the real opponent of of Jesus Christ because it is a fight between light and darkness between good and evil and that's yes. what they all stand for yeah and, and most people fell for that most people fell for the public opinion that that it must be the high priest who has the most profound knowledge and who knows wrong from right and it's the same all over again it's the same all over again hmm. people do not actually read the Bible nowadays they know have the ability they have the chance to, to <laughs> I know <laughs> I know it, 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 in it, the it, Middle Ages they wanted to read the Bible and didn't have the possibility and today they have the possibility and don't want to read it yeah okay Max is there a point that you might want to make at the end um, there was just a quote uh, which uh, came to my mind. Uh, this is um, the following. Um, facts cannot be set aside by false uh, allegations, um, which means basically um, that's the uh, Werkzeug. Is that something tool. Or, uh, it's the kind of tool um, the, the evil uses all day and which forms the so-called public opinion, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. um, these false allegations and this is all where we all have to yeah, fight against some in some way I think yeah Very that's basically good. all <laughs> which uh, yeah that's me that's what's I can find this year <laughs> <laughs> okay then let me um, give some final thoughts on this people speaking of a conspiracy theory <clears throat> are only too lazy to look up the conspiracy. It is a conspiracy theory that Peter was the first Pope. It is a conspiracy theory that Peter was in Rome. It is a conspiracy theory that Peter is the head of the church here on earth. And when you want to find out if that conspiracy theory is true or is false, 
you only have to look up the Bible and the Bible will tell you in plain words on many places, on many different places, that Peter never was in Rome, that Peter never was a bishop, that Peter never was the successor of Jesus Christ here on earth and therefore the Pope who claims to be his successor must be a liar. If you want to show to other people that a conspiracy theory is true or not, you have to look up the facts. You have to do that with conspiracy theories about events like 9-11, about events like um, the Gulf of Tonkin, like the Titanic, like the Federal Reserve conspiracy, like all other kind of conspiracies, you have to look to the facts. And when you look at the facts, you first have to go to the truth. Because you are always only taught the lie in this world. And you only know one side of the medal of the coin. You don't know two sides, the second side. The second side is the truth. And the only truth to be found in this world we are living in is the Bible. And then when you go to uncover the facts of these conspiracy theories, you have to have your Bible as your foundation from which you can start demasking all the lies and rooting out the lies and show to the people if a conspiracy is only a theory or a true conspiracy and what's the background behind it. And therefore, never ever forget the most important part that you need for that, the most important tool that you need for that is the Bible. In English, the 1611 King James Bible. Whether you like it or not, the truth doesn't change because you like it or you don't like it. The truth is the truth. Read your Bible. Maranatha.